Hello, hello everybody. How are you bright lights? Welcome to another episode of Waking Up to Your True Potential. My name is Laura Renankowski and I'm an international life and relationship coach and I coach in English, Spanish, Finnish and Italian. Uh, I was born in Finland, I grew up in Venezuela, studied in Boston, then Miami, and now I live in, in Dublin, Ireland. So um, I'm very excited to, uh, to have my guest today. My guest today is Linda Mishkin. And Linda is a high school teacher. She teaches English and drama. And she was my high school teacher in, in Venezuela, in, uh, in CIC. Colegio Internacional de Caracas. So um, I'm so um, I'm so excited. I'm so excited to um, to have Linda here. And you know, Linda has a really um, you know long history of teaching. She's been teaching since 1975. So she's been a teacher for um, for 46 years, and she's taught all over the world. She's taught in Venezuela, New York City, the Dominican Republic, Kenya, and Florence, Italy. And then, and then Linda's also a mother, and she has two amazing sons. She's the mother of Jason Silva and uh, and Jordan Silva. And uh, Jason is a Jason Silva is a performance philosopher, and he's a motivational speaker about the positive potential of technology and other topics um, as well. And actually, Jason has a beautiful piece on building perspective instead of building bridges, which I think is so great, especially. Now, you know, we, we need to unite in the world in, in general, you know, and get rid of all the division that's going on. So, Linda, you are so welcome. It's so nice to see you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's, it's such a, you know, it's, it's such a pleasure to, to have you, you know, to have you on the series and, and to have a chance to to interview you and to catch up, you know, after, after all these years, you know, after, after all of these years since, um, since high school, you know, and when I, when, you know, when I think about you, Linda, you know, you're like one of these, you're like one of these legendary teachers, you know, like before I went to, you know, before I went to, to CIC, you know, I, I, it's like, I knew about you, you know, for a long time because, you know, my, um, you know, my older sister, you know, she, you know, she went to CIC as well. And she would always tell me, I would always hear all these stories, you know, about you and, you know, the, the things that you would say, like in your English class and how you always made students, you know, think differently. And, you know, literally, I, I think that you invented, you know, thinking out of the box, right? <laughs> like oh, think outside. You think outside the box and um and yeah like when when I went to you know when I went to CIC you know myself you know you were you were my you were my drama teacher in in CIC and you made um you made such a big impact you made such a big impact on on me and you know everybody that I know you know everybody that I know that that went to high school you know I think that I think that if I did a survey and I and I asked you know everybody that went to CIC you know if you could name one teacher you know that that made a lasting impact in you from cic who would that teacher be i'm pretty sure that most people you know most most people would say would say you linda so so yeah so it's just it's just amazing to to see you again and and to and to get to do this interview with you <laughs> thank you so much too kind too kind well it's all true you know like it's it's all true you know and uh yeah, like, yeah, you are, you know, legendary, legendary and, and, and epic in, in everything, everything that you do. And because, because you have such a, you know, you have such a long history of, of teaching, right? You, you know, you, you've taught for 46 years and, you know, you've taught all over the world. I mean, my God, like you, you've, you've probably seen like so many, you know, so many different things in all the different countries where you've taught and, and all the different circumstances um, that, that you've taught in as well. And, you know, one thing, one thing that I talk a lot about, you know, in my series and, and in, my, in my interviews is, you know, we, you know, the world right now is, is a little crazy, right? Like the world right now is a little crazy. There's a little, a, a little exactly there's so there's so much chaos there's so much there's so much division there's so much uncertainty you know people are feeling you know lost and confused and they're just like oh my god what's what's happening you know so many changes are happening everywhere and that's one of the reasons that I started this series as well right to 
to to help help and inspire people in, in these crazy changing times um, that we're living in. And in terms of in terms of education and, and in terms of you know how education is 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 changing and how teaching is changing, you know, what what would you say about that? Uh, I know that you have a lot to say about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's funny that you asked that question, Nara, because it's one of the few it's one of the few institutions that I have always said, actually, it's um, it's worth throwing out the baby with the bath, you know. Right. In other words, the, in the, there's very little, if anything at all, that I would keep about the way schools are are today. I, I often, when I look at the world, you know, you mentioned a crazy world. Yeah. When I look at the world, I often think to my, I, I feel guilty. Because I think, wait a minute, we teachers spend 12 to 14 years with these kids, eight hours a day in our, in our space. Uh What are we doing that's not right, that we create a lot of wonderful people, no question about it, but a lot of monsters and the wonderful people I'm not sure have anything to do with what we've given them in school Uh you know in other words the the for for at least 30 years now maybe not 30 maybe 20 years now there have been talk in schools you know you read the mission statements which are just hogwash they're just something to put on the wall and for parents to read and think yes even though they're very similar and they always say we teach the whole child what does that mean we teach the whole child and you know the implication since uh, I think his name is Coleman. I can't remember his name, um, who speaks about emotional intelligence yes, yeah. and yeah. starting to talk about different intelligence and then teachers are supposed to be aware of this, you know, and, and that's all kind of uh, what I call cosmetic. All right? right. So if you look at the classroom now, OK, so we don't sit in rows in some places. We still sit in rows. All right? So we we sit in a circle. You know, we have it the changes are so subtle and so cosmetic. No, we haven't changed. The core of teaching is the same now as it was in the time of, ta- of Daniel Boone, okay? Uh, the teacher is the dictator and pretty much what happens in the classroom is what the teacher wants. We, right, we say right. it's student-led and student, it's not true, okay? And I'm not just saying it's not true for me, excuse me, on the schools I've been in, but I've been, you know, I've visited hundreds of schools and sat in on hundreds of classes. And you go into an English classroom today and they're reading the books I read, you know, when I was in high school. It's not to say that the books are not good. Mm. They're still good, but there are hundreds of books that are more relevant and, and that, connect to students that's why you have students they don't read i had i've had many students who have never read a book they read spark notes and they read you know because they're not interested in reading because we're trying to teach what we taught way back when it's irrelevant and the way we teach it is irrelevant and so we say we're doing so we have homeroom and we have a life skills class which is nonsense okay Mm -hmm. and um the, I just feel like the whole structure, you don't bring kids to a place where they literally sit for eight hours a day at some talking entity, yeah. you know, who says, oh, no, I do group things and I do. N- not enough. You're still talking like B.F. Skinner said in Harvard, he said, if what you say to the students is something they can read on paper then hand it out. It should not be chalk and talk. It should not be you talking at kids. You're not an encyclopedia and you're not a wealth of knowledge, even if you are. It yeah. should, they should be interactive. They should be moving. They should not be sitting in the classroom. They should be out in the field. You know, they should be learning. They should be, you know, um, following different professionals around to see what each world is like, you know. They should be not, what was the thing that was started by, um, what is our 
Oh, I just went blank. What's our peanut president? What was his? Uh, the peanut. <laughs> yeah, the, the guy who was a peanut. Um, oh, I just went blank. But he had, you know, he started uh, Habit, Habitat for Humanity. All right, Habitat for Humanity. I know. Yeah, I know Habitat for Humanity. That, that's what it should be. You know, the yeah. kids should be, you know, from the time they're little, planting gardens, and then they can yeah. learn about the tomatoes they plant. The biology should be in action. You know, it should be nothing. I can't even, I mean, I've designed schools a million times. As far as I'm concerned, the best school out there, the best concept of school, I visited it 200 years ago. I don't know if it's still the same, but right. it's called the Sudbury Valley School. Okay. And what, what do they do differently there? It's first of all, the school is a democracy. They say if school is to prepare you for life, really, it's the opposite. For 12 or 14 years of your life, you're told what to do, when to do it, what to think, what to read, how to dress, yeah. you know, when to eat lunch, when to go to the bathroom. All of a sudden you're a senior. Yeah. And then we say, well, wh wh what do you want to do? You know, where do you want to go to school? <laughs> really? You're not going to tell me where to go and what to do? It's yeah. ridiculous. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, you, you have an author totally authoritarian uh, system. And then you expect kids to go out and that live democracy. No, yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah. So the Sudbury Valley is a completely democratic school. Okay. And it, it's sort of somewhat like Su Summerhill, which was my inspiration, you know, okay. where everybody gets some vote which means the teachers get one vote students get one vote so and and kids do what they want they, if they want to do nothing if they want to go to school and sit in the grass and do nothing they can wow okay. but they don't they right. don't right because yeah. kids are naturally curious we take the knock the curiosity out of them you know so i mean i could go on forever i think that it has to change radically and people are saying oh now the new normal now everything's going to be online i do not mean that and i hope to hell it's not that okay yeah because yeah. we need to touch people and hold yeah. them and shake hands with them and bump into them and say excuse me and so yeah. i when i say it's going to change and i know that some of the change is going to be school change. The whole, the whole thing has to change dramatically. Has to be smaller. Has to be smaller units. Yeah. Has to be when teachers are interviewed. The first question has to be, not so. How many degrees did you get? And 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 what you know? How well do you prepare your kids for the test? I mean, no. Yeah. It's do you love students? Do you love education? Do you love ideas? Do you, has to be that we can perceive, which is not always possible, that these people do what they do because they love humanity. So yeah. you know, I can go on forever, and I yeah, but anyway, yeah, no, but that, those are those are those are really great points, uh, Linda. And I mean, I I totally agree with you. And and the reason that you made you know that you make such an impact, you know, everywhere where you go is because you know those are those are the values and that's what you transmit right like you've always you know that you've always transmitted everything that you just mentioned right now you've always transmitted that kind of energy you know to to the students and to teachers and to everybody everybody that's around you you know yeah, so we'll yeah yeah you've always yeah. made people think differently when people ask me when you look back do you feel good are you proud are you I feel guilt, to be honest with you, because I remember reading a book way back when I started teaching at one point. You know, I, I don't know if you remember, but anyway, I, I used to, if I had my own classroom, I used to fill the walls with inspiring quotes. And I used to think, well, if the kid is boring, at least he can read quotes that are uplifting, you know, right, and right. my students work. And I always tried to create a safe space, you know? Yeah. And um, to the point where when I taught in the inner city, I had students who would cut school all day. They would just come to my class and just sit because they felt it was a safe space. Okay. Yeah. But I remember reading a book and I can't 
I can't remember. It'll come to me probably after the interview. But anyway, yeah. and one of the things it said, because it was an angry, angry book about how we have to blow up the system. OK. And um, he said, and if you're a teacher who tries to be kind to the students and respect the students and creates a what you consider a safe space and inspiring space, you are just as guilty, if not more, of perpetuating a rotten system. Because what you do is in a day that's generally uh, practicing auto automation okay and the kids are like robots going from one place to the next having no say um often feeling put down whatever and frustrated and then they come to your classroom that you try to make a space where they feel good you're giving a moment of respite whereas if it was all as terrible as it often is not always but often yeah. They would perhaps get angry enough to revolt and to burn the bloody institutions down with nobody in them. Okay. But as long as there's, it's, it's kind of like you're angry and you, you're ready to, I am leaving this relationship because this is abusive. And then, you know, your partner brings you some flowers and says, let's watch something funny. And then you laugh. And you have a moment of respite and you lose some of the momentum that's needed to get rid of this relationship and the same thing to get rid of this school. So I used to feel guilty that I and I do feel guilty because I have perpetuated for 46 years an institution that I absolutely do not believe in. Now, I love the classroom. I love the setting that I think there's a place for that where I'm sitting around with students and we're talking about literature and ideas and life. And I love that. Yeah. But my selfishness in loving that allowed me to do that often in institutions for which I had very little respect. And right. so I don't feel proud of that. But, yeah. you know. Well, I mean, I, I, I understand, I understand what you're saying, but I, but I think that another, another way of looking at it was that, you know, you were like, you were like this, you know, bright light, you know, of like a, a different, a different voice inside of those inside of those institutions, right? Because I mean, that's how change happens. Like, that's how change happens with with people like you, you know, that, you know, that, um, yeah, that, that, that speak out and make people like think about things in a, in a different way, right? So I think that that's that's one that's one way of, of looking at it that you did make a difference even though you didn't completely believe in those institutions but you were inside and you made a difference in, inside of those institutions. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Thanks. It, yeah. <laughs> I'll try yeah. to remember that. You know? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've definitely made. I mean, I know that you've made a huge, made a huge impact. You know, on on me and and everybody everybody in CIC. And, and I'm sure, you know, and I'm sure that, in you know, you've made an impact on, on the lives of all your students, um, you know, around, um, around the world, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so, um, so yeah, so yeah, keep, keep that in mind. If you ever feel okay. guilty, <laughs> just remember, you know, that you were like this, you know, bright light that, you know, that, that made a difference inside, you know, inside these institutions. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I agree with you that, you know that the that the systems you know need to change and i mean i think that now there's so much change in the world right now like on every single level you know like the old systems are just like crumbling down like everywhere and it's like the old systems are crumbling down for like the new systems to emerge right and that includes everything and you know including education and, and schools and everything so it's like yeah it's like the, you know, the new consciousness of humanity, right? And, and, and this is all part of it, right? This is all, all part of it. And I think that, you know, you're one of, the, one of those people that has, you've always been like ahead of your time in a way, right? Like you've been talking about these things for, for a very long time. You know, you've been talking about thinking in a, in a different way and thinking outside the box for 46 years, right? Where most people just, you know, follow the standard rules and guidelines and all of that. And you, you've never been like that, right? So I think that it's, it's great, you know, to, to have teachers like you, you know, that, that inspire people and, and make people, you know, think in, um, yeah. 
think yep. in uh, different uh, different ways. And then um, and then another another thing that you've experienced, you know, you know, you've worked in several of these, you know, international, you know, American schools where, you know, where most of the kids, you know, came from very, you know, wealthy, you know, wealthy families. But then but then you also worked in you also worked in the Bronx, right? Like so you've you've literally seen like literally seen both extremes right of the of the education system so do you want to tell me a little bit about that about that experience well it was um it was eye-opening it yeah. was heart-wrenching but it was also inspiring you know when, when i first got there um i was i was incredibly nervous okay um and I, um, I remember, I remember the interview, I, there were like 15 people around a table, there were counselors and teachers and, and the assistant principal, I thought it was an excellent interview, because they actually read my, you know, what I had written. And, um, and I remember that they, you know, they said to me, well, how do you feel one of the things they said, well, how do you feel about, um, kids calling you by your first name because here everybody calls everybody all the way up to the principal by the first name and I thought that was a sign that I was supposed to be <laughs> yeah yeah because yeah, you've always been so like I that. said that's yeah. what I've done my whole life you know? yeah 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 so I like that and then they said to me well and they said how do you feel about you know sometimes the kids here are aggressive if not physically which they are sometimes but but certainly verbally the language that they use you know is you know, every other word is a curse word and you know if i if i can use a curse word right now you know i apologize anybody i offend but i remember saying my response was look I don't have any authority issues. I'm not the kind of person who says, I said, sit down and I, you know, res no, I know yeah. that respect has to be earned. And I've never, I've never had a problem with that. But, and I actually said, which I didn't, I thought after I said, it, I thought, oh my God, I'm in an interview. What are they going to think? But I said, if a student says to me, go fuck yourself. Yeah. I don't, have a, I don't say, go to the office, what kind of language is that? I know it's not about me. I know the kid has an issue. I know there's hurt, there's pain, there's anger. And I am the perfect target at the moment or the only available target. So he uses it in the hope that I can get angry. So that means some of his anger, you know, is shared kind of thing. And I don't care. I, if somebody says that to me, I'd say, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. And maybe we can talk when you're less angry. I, it's not a problem. So yeah. I don't, and I knew, I felt this kind of energy in the room, some people looking at each other, she's going to be okay. <laughs> Clearly, the students frequently say that to their teachers. Yeah. And one of the teachers there, she was the head English department. And for whatever reason, she just didn't like me, you know, mm -hmm. she was a very good teacher, and I know the students loved her. Many of the students loved her, but she just didn't like me. And um, she said to me, I remember when I explained some of the things that I do in my class, she said, uh, if you do any of your hippy dippy shit with these kids, they're gonna eat you up alive. Right. And I don't know if you remember, um, because I don't remember if I, was already doing it then. I used to start my class with a quick eyes closed and take a comfortable deep breath. Yeah. You know, it was very short and then it would end, you know, and then the last one is in inhaling courage, creativity, confidence, and kindness. Yes. And say to yourself, as I say out loud, every day in every way, I'm getting better, better, and better. And yes. then I would ring this bell that I still have. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if I was already doing it by then, but yeah. as far back as I remember, that's how I started my class. And I wanted to start it here. Yeah. When she said that to me, I felt this anxiety because I was so nervous. I said, oh God, maybe I better not. Yeah. Yeah. And then I thought to myself, no, 
that's part of who I am, part of what I believe in, part of what sets the mood, the tone, the energy in my class, you know? Yeah. And I did it and I was very serious. I said, this is how are we going to start every class? My experience has shown me that it focuses our attention, blah, 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 starts. And then I said, and then we did it. They were all very serious. And because I had these random one class right after the other, sometimes I didn't know, you know, where I was standing. So sometimes I would, the class would begin and I would forget. There would yeah. always, always be a kid, you know, yo, Linda, aren't we going to breathe? <laughs> yo, Linda, aren't we going to breathe? I love I that. <laughs> say, yeah, I said, yeah. So, and then I would do it. So, and then they ended up being the vast majority, you know, wonderful kids and proved and there are always exceptions you know my theory that if you take care of the heart the head will take care of itself you know when the kids know you love and you care yeah these kids who others are afraid of and who often end up in jail and who have done perhaps in many cases some terrible things yeah can the the part of them that is also there that's wonderful is what is awakened so it yeah. was a very it was a trying experience because i knew many of their stories and i thought if i read it in a book i would think it's an exaggeration you know yeah and i am in you know in touch with maybe 80 percent of those kids and it was a wonderful experience it was eye-opening it was heart-wrenching it was exhausting yeah, I can't, but, yeah, I can't imagine. Um, but yeah. it was very special, you know. And yeah. I did learn that in very many ways, adolescent kids are kids. Yeah. Like when prom came around, <laughs> they spent money they didn't have, okay, yeah. to have a limousine, to take them, you know, to buy dresses, you know, um, uh, to oh my God, you know, to go to this prom. And believe it or not, the whole concept of king or queen, I think is absolutely archaic and ridiculous, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had it. They had it. The I, I would never have thought. But the difference was it wasn't the prettiest or the most popular. Right. It was the person who was the nicest and everybody liked. Oh, okay. So, okay. so that I yeah. liked it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. I wouldn't have left, but you know, my 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 partner wanted to go abroad, and he yeah. changed actually changed his career from working with pharmaceuticals and making incredible money to becoming a librarian. I said, "Oh my God! Now that we get together, you're gonna you're gonna go you're gonna start making nothing," you know. And, like, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so he did a second master's and at Pratt Institute and studied library science. And now he teaches, you know, theory of knowledge, which is I, part of the IB program. And, and he teaches research skills. And he's a wonderful librarian who the kids yeah. love. So, yeah. Wow, that's, that's, yeah. that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for, for sharing that. And, you know, sure. and, and another, another thing that, that we have to talk about, you know, <laughs> is the survival and leadership workshop right because i know like you you mentioned you know that you did it for like 11 years in high school and and 13. i still okay 13 okay 13 wow it's amazing and, and today, today's the 13th too so look at that you know i love i love the symbolism <laughs> i love the symbolism of the of the numbers you know yeah yeah, yeah but yeah, i remember yeah. you know the survival and leadership workshop that that i did that i did with you you know when i was a senior in high school you know i laugh because it's like I almost, you know, I almost didn't survive that survival <laughs> workshop, you know, like oh my so God. many, so many things happened to me, you know, in that survival and, and leadership workshop. And then, you know, like we did, we did this Omega thing where you like hold on to this Omega thing. And then like, it looks like you're about to, you know, crash into a tree and then it pulls you back at the last minute. And then I landed on my foot, I landed on my foot. So then I couldn't, I couldn't walk, I couldn't walk. And then of course, you know, the little cabin that I was staying in was like the furthest cabin, of course, of course, you know, but then like uh, something we, we shared a really, really special moment in that survival and leadership workshop because, you know, because, you know, after, after, you know, after I landed on my foot and I couldn't walk, you know, I, I couldn't do the rest of the, the, yeah. of the activities. Right. So then I was, you know, I was in my cabin, you know, feeling all sorry for myself, you know, because I couldn't walk. And then, and then you, you came to the cabin and we had like a really, really special 
you know, heart to heart, you know, um, conversation, you know, that really, you know, that, that really helped me at that, at that time, you know, my parents were getting divorced and, you know, you, you really, you really helped me. So that, that made a really, you know, big, you know, lasting impact and, and impression, you know, on me. That's cool. So, so thank you for that. Thank you for that again. <laughs> 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 and then and then yeah everything that we shared you know even though I laugh and I'm like yeah like you know like there were so many crazy experiences in the survival and leadership workshop but we did bond a lot we did bond a lot as as a as a senior class you know in this in this workshop and especially you know you mentioned you know especially the part where we all said things like you know said things to each other and then everybody was crying and yeah it was it was very emotional so so yeah, those those are those are great experiences to have, especially especially when you're a senior, right? Especially when you're a senior about yep. to go out, about to graduate and go out into the world. <laughs> Crossroad, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was that was an amazing that was an amazing experience. And um, another another thing that I wanted to ask you, Linda, was that you know you you've always been, you know, uh, you've always been like so so happy and positive and like uplifting i remember that you know even in high school you know you were oh you would always you were always i mean i don't i don't think i don't think i ever saw you like i don't think i ever saw you like having like a like a bad day and of course of course you've had bad days but you know you're you're one of those people that's just so positive and you uplift everybody so like what's your secret how do you stay like so happy and positive and uplifting all the time well, you know, when I think about it, you know, it's, I, I, I can't help, I remember a line from the movie, not the movie, the book, The Fixer, okay. by Bernard Mallon, and uh, this one part, you know, it's a Jewish guy in the, in Russia when that was the worst thing you could be during the pogroms. And he's accused basically of this horrible murder that happened to a kid. They drained his blood. It was horrible. Right. He's totally innocent. Wasn't anywhere near the place. Has nothing to do with it. They tried to, 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 to make it seem like it's part of a Jewish ritual. It's ridiculous. But in any event, he's in jail. He was arrested. And it's clear that everything's being fabricated against him. Right. And he gets a, de a defense lawyer from, because uh, he's in Kiev, he gets a defense lawyer who is a, an idealist, you know, and, and uh, he's going to, you know, it's, it, he starts to, there are footsteps, he starts to hear footsteps, he starts to hear weird things that he knows he's being watched, maybe threatened, and um, Yaakov is the main character who's defending, and he says, I, I, I don't understand how, because it's, it's clear the guy's going to pay for what he's do, trying to help this Jewish guy. And in fact, he does, you know, he, 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 he gets dragged into a sale, he gets hanged and made to seem like suicide, you know, yeah. and um, you saw it coming. But before that happens, Yaakov says, I don't understand. How can you be so positive? How can you be so, so idealistic when it's so obvious? that things are terrible and it's not going to, and he says, to be honest with you, Yaakov, the reason that I'm optimistic is because it's the only way that I can function. Mm. If I allow myself to focus on all the terrible things that are going on, the injustices, the cruelties, the, the unfair distribution of luck, if you want to say it or of anything else, he yeah. said, I would, I would be paralyzed and I would probably just die in my paralysis. So the only way I can function is to be an idealist right. and an optimist. And, and, and when I read it, it really resonated, you know, because people have said to me what you say, I yeah. mean, don't get me wrong. I, I, I do, I get sad. I cry now, yeah. everything. It's, it's always everything. Man. I cry when I'm happy. I cry when I'm sad. I cry when I'm moved. I cry when I'm frustrated. Uh, you know, I cry when I'm angry. So I am a cry baby, but right. some, you know, people have also said, don't you ever get sad? And I absolutely do. And I yeah. fact, I think that there's a, a very fine, um, almost imperceptible 
sadness deep inside of me because there are so many things that are not right because right. there is so much suffering in the world, you know, yeah, because yeah. now everybody is blessed the way I've been blessed, you know, but it's there to keep me sensitive and aware and always in a, in a, an energy of gratitude and joy. Yeah. And, um, and because I know that optimism and laughter and love is contagious, that's what I want to spread. Yeah. So you know, if we have everything inside of us, I have had the luck or the practice of focusing on, on that because then the person next to me is contagious, And when they're sick with joy and happiness and whatever, they give it back to me as well. Yeah. And that's one major thing. And the other thing was when I was, I want to say, I want to say maybe 40 years ago, I first took the silver mind method oh yeah and that a hundred percent enriched my life because it gave me tools Mm. to combat the time when sadness happens right you know um the buddhists say you know feel the sadness and go through it and i understand it and may work for many but I would rather, I recognize I'm sad because recognize it, speak to it and say, I I am sad. This is not good, but I'm not staying here. And so, so the silver mind method gives you tools to helps you understand that whatever energy you're in is the energy you're going to attract. And so you can't deny, it's not about repression. So yeah. I'm sad or I'm angry because of this and I have a right to be angry. Okay, what am I going to do about it? And then I'm going to visualize a time when I feel joy and positivity so that my energy changes and I start to attract that. So that course, I have to, you know, I met actually Jose Silva once and I just want to, he looks like a little fat meatball. And I just wanted to hug him and hold him and say, you're definitely, you know, an emissary of yeah. divine energy, you know? So I would definitely say that that course took me to another level of positivity yeah. and, you know, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's great. And, you know, like everything that you said, uh, so it, it resonates with me so much because I'm like, I'm the same way, you know, as well. Like people are always like, how can you be, how can you be so happy and positive all the time? Like has nothing bad ever happened to you. And Actually, the opposite is true. Like, I have been through so much. Like, I have gone through hell and back, you know? But the thing is that it's always a choice, right? It's always a choice. Like, you choose if you're going to be happy and positive, and you choose if you're going to be miserable and sad, right? You always have a choice. And, and I think that, like, you know, you, you mentioned about not getting stuck, right? And, you know, the U2 song, you know, stuck in a moment, like, always comes to my mind, right? Because before, when I used to go through like a, a difficult moment, I would get stuck in that moment. And, but now it's like I move through th- through things like a lot faster. Like if I if I fall down, you know, I get up, I dust myself off, and I and, you know, and I continue, you know, and I continue walking. I, I continue with my life, right? And I think it's important not to make it sound simplistic. It's not about um thinking positive like Pollyanna yeah no it's it's kind of like two men looked out of prison bars one saw mud and one saw stars they're both in prison either you and you know Viktor Frankl's book yeah um, man's search for meaning yeah yes my favorite book I was just gonna ask you yeah it's magnificent and he says in his assessment the people who survived the holocaust who weren't killed yeah okay um were the people who had something to look forward to yeah Um, they visualized the day when they would find a relative again and when they would be able to wake up to not looking like scum in other words they or a or a really strong faith in god that that this is a test something Something. but those were the people who had the ability not of it's not denial. I mean, how can you deny you're in the Holocaust? Sure. You're starving to death. Yeah. The people are dropping dead around you and yeah. you can't deny it. But if that's 
all you think, oh, my, this think. horror, then it it's kind of like the energy, it, it's just worse for you, you know, exactly. I mean, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, definitely. Yeah, man, so it's not about minimizing yeah. the difficulty. You yeah. when people sometimes and they do some of the propenders, some of the people who propagate this philosophy, they say, you have a choice. It's your choice. You know, well, my child just died. And I feel like a whole chunk of my heart is being chewed on right. by an alligator. Don't, don't, don't. It hurts. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. It should have been me. The person has to be allowed now. Yes. In a certain amount of time. And, and it's longer for some and longer for others, shorter for others. It's about a recommendation to remember the times that were wonderful with him you know, yeah. uh, visualize, you know, to sort of pull yourself out. You have a, and I just read an excellent article that actually speaks about grieving and speaks about a guy who lost his son in 9-11. Right. And he has decided, I mean, he's going to grieve for the rest of his life. Okay. okay. And if that's his only way of coping and anything else feels fake, to, okay. Right. But, but perhaps giving people the tools to how about, I mean, it's this many years after, you know, how about just spending an hour a day remembering some of the fun moments you had when he was alive yeah. so that, you know, anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and, and that's the thing, like every person is different and, and every process is different. And, and with any kind of loss, right? Like with any kind of loss, whether it's that somebody passed away or like yeah, yeah, yeah. a relationship ends uh, or heartbreak, yeah, yeah. whatever, like, like you can, you can stay in that loss, you know, yeah. you can stay in that loss for however long you, you want yeah. to stay. Right. Yeah, yeah, but it's, yeah. it's always a choice. Right. I think that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like everybody has to do whatever, you know, whatever feels, you know, um, right to them. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, uh, wow, like Linda, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, you know, for, for this interview. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of your knowledge and, and all of your, you know, insights. Um, I'm sure, you know, I, I know that, you know, so many people that went to CIC, you know, will see this interview and be like, wow, oh my God, it's Linda, it's Linda again, you know? So, well, yeah. I just would like to, I would like to leave them and you yeah. with the, uh, with a thought that, you know, I, I think it's also Gibran when he's talking about the a fountain of water, you know, and, and he's drinking the water and the water is drinking him in a sense. I mean, I've always said that my students have always given me at least as much as I've given them you know, in terms of attention and kindness and receptivity, that's what has always filled my life, you know, and, and if I had one bit of advice, because advice, nobody wants it, you know, and, <laughs> and, uh, but I still can't help it. It comes from James Joyce's, uh, the author, James Joyce, yeah. had never had children. He was kind of a, he was kind of a strange character, but he never had children, but he had nephews or I don't know if it's one nephew or several, but a nephew said to him, you know, Uncle James, if you could give me advice for life, yeah. you know, to have a better life, what, what would that be? And I always share that with my students now. Yeah. And he says, well, if you want a good life, the best life you can have, I have three points of advice. Hmm. Number one, be kind. Always, everywhere, and to everyone. Yeah. Number two, always be kind. <laughs> always, everywhere, and to everyone. And number three, of course, and then of course the whole class says it, always be kind. Always be kind. Always to everyone, everywhere. So that's it, you yeah. know. That's that's great advice, and and it's so great that you know that you're ending with James Joyce, you know, who's an Irish author, and I live in <laughs> Ireland, so there you go. It all you know, you like, <laughs> it all comes around, right? Full circle, full circle, yeah. as, as they say. But I I totally agree. I totally agree with um with be kind. I yeah, 
I yeah, that's that's how I that's how I try to you know live uh, live my life um, as well. Like be kind to everybody, no matter no matter who they are, and no matter you know their and even no matter even no matter sometimes how they treat you. I mean, short of yeah. literal abuse, okay. Yeah. It, you know, if if a waiter, if somebody is grumpy with you or not kind, you never know what they're living. You know, you yeah. never know what's going on in their life. Just don't let them control how you're going to be. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah, I know that. Yeah. They're not nice. They're grumpy. You know, so. Exactly. You always like that. That's one thing. That's one thing that I always say in my coaching, you know, the only thing that you can control is yourself, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. You can only control your thoughts, your words and your actions, right? So yeah, yeah. whatever, what, whatever anybody else says or does, you know, as or thinks. Doesn't have nothing. to determine. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. This, this has thank been you. amazing. This thank you crazy. very much. You take care. Yeah, thank you. You too. And lots of love. Th thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for, um, for joining us today. I hope you, you liked uh, this interview and you feel inspired. And just as Linda said, you know, be kind, be kind, be kind. You know, be kind to yourself and, and be kind to everybody, uh, everybody around you. And uh, and don't forget to uh, to tune in uh, every Friday. I have a new amazing interview, and um, and you can follow me on social media as well. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And you can email me at lauracoaching at gmail .com. and my website is laurarenkowski.com. So uh, so thank you so much, Bright Lights. Uh, be you know be well, stay happy, and uh, and I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> Ciao.